Well, bonsoir, good evening. Um, still, you know, a few words of introduction, but in this case, not about the exhibition. We kind of uh, presented it shortly in the bookstore before, but uh, about uh, our kind of uh, curators and protagonists tonight. So, je suis très heureux d'être ici avec uh, le commissaire de l'exposition Retail Apocalypse, Van Finan, um, Freddy Fischli et Neil Solson sont les directeurs de l'espace d'exposition à l'Institut d'Histoire et de la Théorie de l'Architecture GTA de l'ETH Zurich. Ensemble, ils ont organisé de nombreuses expositions sur l'art et l'architecture, such as uh, Ready Made, Belong to Everyone, at Swiss Institute, New York, uh, 2018, a monographic show on Trixa Robert Hausmann at the Kunstwerke Institute for Contemporary Art de Berlin, Nothing Uncontemporary, and uh, they have been working on retrospective inside that side on the work of the Dutch uh, designer Petra Bleis at the La Triennale in Milano and the ATH in Zurich. And uh, I'd love to highlight also some of the recent uh, publication uh, works because actually I'm a great fan of some of them, like the Dan Graham 1978 models book published with the GTA or the publication following the uh, great Richard Hamilton and Sigrid Gideon exhibition in Zurich, 2017. So, I will do it very short. Please join me in welcoming Freddy Fish and Neil Solson to present Retail Apocalypse Grand Final tonight. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for your interest, for coming. We had a really great time working together on this show, although for us the, the whole thing started quite some time ago. Just before uh, COVID hit, we opened the original show in Zurich. It was only open for kind of two weeks or something. It already closed again, and then we started to work on the book and we wouldn't know like how far still this whole endeavor would take us and it was really great to get all your inputs and working together and to now see this completely new show opening here at the CCA. Thanks so much. And the show is not kind of one argument that we try to define and place. It's much, it was much more a kind of investigation that started a few years ago but then really developed in many new layers through the team of the CCA. So it's kind of an ongoing search, which in its nature, as you will see, also is quite joyful. And basically the exhibition on view kind of traces this uh, kind of for us a form of time capsule. So it starts in, with uh, images like this one, for example here by Eugène Auger, the uh, photographer that took these amazing images of show windows as a kind of starting point from, um, this one is from 1911, I think, until really recent, these anonymous warehouses. So it looks at the kind of the joy, the beginning of retail culture, the Bon Marché, here the uh, work by the Swiss artist Felix Volontor, you see kind of the uh, kind of the joy, the social moment involved at the market and then versus the contrast of uh, retail today. So we kind of try to look at different forms of cultural practice through the lens of commerce. And this is kind of the beginning and the end of the show in the sense or of this investigation. And one entry point for us, I guess, was from the beginning the, the display while working with art, architecture, fashion, when it's not so much about one individual discipline, then so much often the, the, the display gives you a way of reading a work, not just the what, but how you present something. And doing exhibitions at the architecture department with so many yeah, professors and so many skilled people, we often do shows where we bring something in, but then we ask for a reading by other architects and, and stage these, these works. And we were always um, really under the influence of how your shopping is about display, how the museum tries to uh, sell you something, and how we could do a show 
about this dialogue of the two. And in the beginning, we took this title that is also not so usual for us, like Retail Apocalypse, that is somehow was over the top, but then we thought, oh, it's quite fitting because it's also so commercial, it's trying to sell you this show, but it's a little bit too much, this advertisement for Retail Apocalypse, but then with the opening of the show, the, the pandemic hit and the Retail Apocalypse somehow really happened and the store closed and this real transformation took place suddenly. So there is this kind of this uh, recalling or kind of displacement of museum and the commercial realm. And I think it uh, becomes quite apparent in the hallway of the CCA, where the hallway suddenly becomes almost like a high street. And you look at the museum vitrines, you look at the archival materials, like here, this Beaumarché document, you suddenly look at it as if you're perhaps in a kind of in a Parisian high street. And you suddenly realize that the show window is, and the museum vitrine kind of works with the same conditions. Or, and that this show window, of course, is kind of, was, um, not, uh, was kind of an inspiration or a, a type of work that f goes throughout the avant-garde. Like here, um, you see the reflecting Duchamp in the Surrealist exhibition. And another example which we studied was um, Kiesler, who at the beginning of his practice worked both in theater, but also in show window design. And here you see this great example of the sex uh, store, where he created this really abstract, kind of almost void white display, uh, just presenting this one pair of shoes to the right. And Kiesler took this really serious, this method of display, and he published a book in the 30s, where, where he, uh, kind, of, kind of a method book, where he described his method of displays for malls. And the whole book kind of derives from his study of um, modern art. So in a moment where retail was somehow actually ending or is in a, was in a radical moment of shift, we thought then it's a kind of good moment to look back to this history and understand it when it's somehow ending where yeah, some actual shifts are actually happening where in the beginning retail there was the, we looked at these typologies of the flaneur, for example, going to the city, kind of the dandy, looking at other people, looking at oneself reflected in the mirror, how one behaves with the shopping bag and this shift to a now where we no longer look at the products but much more the products look at us through algorithms and our uh, behavior to kind of study these types um, and also figure out how people like Kiesler would react to this and see himself not so much this uh, separation of evil consumerism and uh, the cultural realm that is somehow protected uh, from this, but the idea of the kind of US American idea of a democratization of culture through shopping, to to bring actual cultural value uh, of modernism much closer to the people through products. And this also reminded us, of course, yeah, of like the Bauhaus and modernism, not just thinking about the painting, but this total idea of culture where you would also do a lamp, applied art, that it's one uh, big endeavor, one big ideology that uh, people, one would strive for, not just in the closed cultural sphere, but with Kiesler really bringing it uh, to the shop. And one example in this direction of work I personally really admire is this um, liner cut by Hannes Meyer. It's uh, reproduced in one of the vitrines outside and I mean, it's quite apparent, it's kind of a modernist tableau, it could be a graphic work of art, but at the same time, it's a, a plan, a shelf interior plan for Coop, and Coop is kind of the typical Swiss deli. So it was kind of a plan for a local grocery shop. But of course, you see the idea of the shelving, this normative interior kind of is completely ideologically traced. 
And going back to the show window, I think there are also many readings, even of the famous large glass by Duchamp, that one could kind of see it through the lens of the shop window. So it's all about kind of persisting to the glass, in the sense. And yes, yeah, so in the show you will discover quite a few modernist programmatic works, like um, by Corbusier, the shoe store, or as Freddie already mentioned, that for example you would have like the art historian Siegfried Gideon to even design a lamp or conceive in collaboration with other architects like Max Bill or Roth even a shop to, uh, and then further on to kind of show this displacement of museum versus shop, you have designers like Albini that would on the one hand create these displays to show fur coats, but at the same time he would also design museum interiors that you know. Yeah, whereas also looking at these examples, we were uh, thought again also of the idea of the good form that was um, uh, in the jury of Max Bill uh, for us in Switzerland, kind of really educating people through culture, through consumer products of what is the good form and what is not, and how uh, strict this kind of uh, rules were at the time. And to continue in this line, for example, that's a beautiful example as well that you might know from uh, Lili Reich. And then, of course, I th um, one kind of bigger part, and I think that's also something which really uh, immediately one kind of follows to retail architecture is um, kind of in the so-called postmodern uh, times of architecture. Here we see um, Hans Hollein, in a, but I think that's a, a, a not such a fortunate example. Maybe that's a nicer one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the famous candle store that, of course, through the temporary condition of a store, one kind of can achieve extraordinary projects. Or the Sunar showrooms, which I think is also really special in Chicago, or the kind of the almost utopian shop displays by Pierre Paulin, or in Zurich, Gaia Olentis uh, car showroom. And another example in this direction, which we really kind of learned the essence of retail space, here by uh, Swiss architect Smolenicki, who was, um, and this was his first project in Zurich, and it's a photograph by the, uh, Christian Keretz, actually should be in color because it's all about color. It's a hairdresser and the hairdresser, a hair saloon has no program. It, I mean, the only thing you need is sink, but it's kind of a mobile sink you need and you need chairs. So it's kind of an empty space. And the only thing a hair salon needs to do is to shine to the outside. And in this sense, of course, color is the most immediate um, thing to apply. And it's the, if you would see it in real, it still exists. You should look for it if you're ever in Zurich. It's um, really stark primary colors. So the architecture is like this one millimeter thin uh, layer. And then through yeah, these times of um, maybe postmodern buildings and when the, the, the sign was this important uh, moment, we of course got Duck uh, is like struck again by the side um, works, also Venturi's works, of course, and the best showrooms that kind of had this openness to almost incorporate a retail apocalypse by building this kind of billboard-like architecture where you can somehow make the subversion of the place already part of the advertisement of the place, that the building itself is in a ruinous uh, status seemingly, therefore attracting the customers to actually buy. And this crisscrossing of how can you reappropriate between consumerism, architecture, and art, and kind of seemingly built in um, uh, a subversion was, was kind of um, a high time at this moment, I think. Yes, so in a way, um, you would almost kind of exploit the criticism as an image in a really interesting form. And here, the kind of the crossing of art and architecture 
became really emphasized because James Vines himself came from art and he would get into architecture through the clients, the owners of the best showrooms who were art collectors. And um, also by side, James Vines is this really be uh, beautiful examples of the showrooms he designed for the streetwear pioneer uh, of Willy Wear, which, um, where he basically brought the street to the inside. So you see all these chain link um, or these brick structures that he would bring into the shop interior. Unfortunately, the photograph of the store is missing and this is quite special, this drawing, because it's, it's not the real drawing for the side showroom, but actually it's a new drawing by James Vines from uh, 2020 where he redraw the display for the showrooms for the Cooper Hewitt museum space. So again, it's this kind of displacement of the commercial into the museum and kind of back again. And that's another example which we didn't want to place here, but it's anyway great. It's by um, Richard Glockman, who um, is, I think, kind of the, one of the first architects who worked in Chelsea and uh, worked on the Chelsea art galleries. And at the same time, he did several stores, and one was this Helmut Lang store that kind of mimicked or kind of absorbed the aesthetics of minimal art into the display. So you would enter the space, which looked like the new Chelsea galleries at the time. You would see these enormous kind of, kind of Donald Schott, Sarah-like volumes, and then you would turn and then you would see that there are actually vitrines containing garments by Helmut Lang. And also this uh, Jenny Holzer uh, beam in, uh, as part of the space. So this kind of, you would see that how uh, commerce really absorbed aesthetics and methods of art at that time. And um, a big and important pretext for our show was, of course, the now 20 years ago Harvard Guide to Shopping by, by Kohlhaas. And to kind of, in this moment of anniversary, looking back and thinking what is still valid and what is not. Like, his big assessment at the time was that every form of public activity became shopping, that everywhere you go, now it seems almost redundant to explain that the airport, all these places are basically a shopping center. And this kind of looking back, it's somehow almost kind of sweet to hear because it escalated so much uh, from this point on that it's not even the places anymore, but it is somehow embedded within you and all your behavior. And looking at these times, what Jacques Kohlhaas, but also Herzog Thömeron and these architects that dealt with it at this time kind of tried to already anticipate by building shops like the, like the famous um, OMA uh, Prada store in New York that kind of at the moment did not want to be only a boutique but realized that it should be an event venue and people would not go there for the clothes anymore because of concerts and other things would, would happen there. That now also the, the other Prada store by Herzog Dömeron um, in, in Tokyo has almost kind of a, a somehow a sweet connotation how it was overrun, that at this time it was the idea to build in uh, monitors and cameras and have like a hybrid digital experience that the whole building would be kind of like a lens looking at you and then while you would go in there there's this uh, snorkel like monitors coming from the walls and would show you digitally the clothes that you already bought in this kind of um, quirky way that why you need to bring all this hardware into the store that is now just seemingly um, on your phone or anyways with you uh, with the cloud. So in a way, like at that moment, we would say that with, for example, with the Harvard Guide to Shopping, you would in a way um, it, it like start to reflect the kind of this heyday of neoliberalism 
So in a way, you not just kind of just play out with the different um, architectural potentials you have in terms of form, but really reflect more on the societal issue, but at the same time, also in a contradicting form, engage with this new condition, with this neoliberal kind of extension of different forms of work. And that's, I guess, what uh, the firm of OMA did, for example, with um, working on advertisements, which really kind of pushed the boundary of uh, common architectural work. And at the same time, like what Herzog Dömer, but also OMA did at that time to f believe in, in the kind of the new means or the new methods um, that retail could kind of um, gain through the digital. So that's a quite fascinating early work by OMA, which is not so known. And it's a, a Samsung, I think a Samsung uh, showroom, so kind of a tech technological showroom, which again looks like a museum for kind of early electronic instruments. And you see that here you had to have this almost promise of the, the digital that you would kind of have this kind of almost playground-like stream through a shop. Or, as Freddie said before, with Herzog Dömer in Tokyo, that the shop itself would become this almost um, kind of sheer or tout kind of like crystal that with full of lenses that would kind of react and give you feedback. And um, yes, would kind of create, become this um, machine of looking in that sense. So at that time, I think you really, they had, there was the, it's the golden time of retail architecture, one could say. And now kind of looking at the current architecture, we were of course also struck yeah, being at the ETH and seeing that somehow yeah, the architecture offices, they always highlight their museums, their public buildings, schools, so to say, but then how this how um, within their oeuvre, always shops also pop up and how um, the kind of the, the style of the studio there goes much more turbo-like uh, visible, but then it's always hidden within the oeuvre that is always kind of showing this, the public works. But then here the kind of yeah, charming Belgian architecture of the Welderwink tire that is always building with like improvising and but then kind of using this just as an image to do this lingerie store that kind of plays with improvisation but is far away from an actual being so but becomes this commercial image to sell these products. Yes, so I think probably you know many of these examples from, for example, uh, Old Charty. Uh, store which has which an image which also would be great in color it's with a, a light blue turquoise mar marble and it really has like a, a sacral kind of feeling atmosphere in the store or Smiljan Radic who built several um, shops which are quite uh, experimental but here for example he did this runway for Celine which was this enormous inflatable that for the duration of the fashion show would inflate. And for him, Smiljan Radic is really invested in uh, forms of radical design and architecture. And he kind of, through the, this kind of temporary means of fashion, he has the ability to experiment in this direction. But again, we are mainly interested at the, when the work kind of starts to reflect on this shift and on the kind of the double nature of the of this um, commercial realm. And I think one that's an, a photograph we think is quite telling in this direction. It's the a museum in uh, Lebanon by Adache Architects, which is a private museum that is in um, a shopping mall. And we were there a few years ago and uh, the German painter Albert Oehlen had an exhibition in the museum neighboring the mall. And he had these uh, really large scale collage paintings consisting of billboards. And he placed the billboards right at the exits that, would, that are usually closed, that would lead to the mall. And he opened the door so the paintings would directly kind of go into the shops on the other side. So it's kind of, it was about the threshold between the kind of the cultural realm of the paintings motif itself into this commercial realm of the mall. And this threshold 
we became kind of re really interested in another kind of image showing this, for example, is by Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Um, she did uh, one in New York. There was a tradition of, at the mall of Bonvit Teller, the department store that artists like Dali or Warhol would design the show windows. And also, uh, Lynn Hirschman Leeson was invited, and she placed this uh, mannequin, um, which uh, which kind of crashed her hand through the show window onto the street. And it was an, for her it was kind of an er early exploration of the virtual screen. So she would kind of see the, the show window as a proto screen, so to say. Yeah, kind of breaking what you also explained before, this moment of desire that Duchamp uh, saw within the window, where he then also worked with the windows, um, or the windows that, of course, all these artists from Dali to Warhol did, she kind of killed <laughs> this, uh, this case where you're locked, locked out. And this kind of engaging, being on, on, on both sides, uh, we also found with many artists like Claire Fontaine uh, that work with this play of being kind of um, uh, as if they would be a, a company themselves, actually called Claire Fontaine, and by therefore almost disappearing as a, as a person, working with these uh, corporate um, images and how they present themselves. And this one is a striking work by them, I think. It's called Good Evil, the apple really in paradise before the bite happened. That kind of reflects on the image that also Apple themselves want to produce as the good kind of Western good before this moment happened and the bite of Maybe capitalism is there. So, because of course the question is if you start to kind of, you can kind of reflect and criticize these economic structures, but, of, but then many practices that we looked at, of course at the end you kind of play in this market. You work with this contradiction that you maybe reflect, maybe you show the ruin as cited of the mall, but at the end you also cater it back as a formal project, or you maybe say, okay, as an architect, I acknowledge the fact of this condition and I go into advertisement or consulting, which is a sphere, but then there are also other practices that kind of go in an opposite direction, and this is something we try to uh, kind of um, investigate, and one example is indeed Claire Fontaine, because what Claire Fontaine tried to do as an, in a an quite ambiguous experiment as well is to say, we are not a real human. We are, we kind of, we are, uh, it's actually, Claire Fontaine are, is, a, is a famous Staples uh, paper store in France. It's kind of a, a common paper brand. So it's something that, it's kind of the it's most generic female name that one could have because also you can't Google it. You will always arrive with addresses of the next paper shop in France. So you take this, um, alter ego, you take this invented name and use it as an umbrella, as a kind of quasi-brand structure where you can operate behind. So Claire Fontaine is operated by two authors behind. And through this kind of fictional character, this uh, kind of avatar um, artist idea, you are mu much more agile. You don't have a kind of a, a vulnerability of a biography, so to say, you can kind of, you can switch your entity and can react. So you kind of take the idea of the brand, of the notion of the branding, but you bring it into this layer of fantasy that gives you quite a lot of freedom. But also, not only in that sense, it also gives you a sense of insider um, operation. Because the people behind, you don't, we don't know exactly who they are necessary, but they can kind of have different functions implied. And this changes the, the distribution that artists have. Here you see a work of Seth Price at the at Documenta, where he wasn't exhibiting in the museum, but in the actual Kaufhaus uh, in Kassel. Um, these uh, fashion garments that would be there, that themselves are, of course, they are uh, 
fashion, they're like pieces, clothes that you can put on, but much more they're envelopes, like the letters that one would receive from a bank where inside you have this um, printing that you cannot look through. So the clothes themselves become this new form of distribution where you can act and appear as an artist, um, not just within the museum, but within different forms of, um, of, of, uh, of communication, yes, of distribution, to go back. And kind of this, let's say, artistic meta layer of someone like Seth Price or Claire Fontaine, which of course exists only in the art space, I think then uh, people brought into the real kind of commercial space back again. And one example is Telfar. There is a, in the space you see a mannequin which is by Telfar. And Telfar is a collective which also is kind of surrounding Telfar, who is a, a figure, but again a figure which is almost, who is almost kind of an avatar figure that again is, is a real figure, Telfar Clemens, but he's again operated or a kind of a, a, a phantom of a larger collective. And here, through, um, the, through the practice of streetwear, this collective around Telfa kind of could build up quite a political, um, artistic project. So Telfa is a, it's a brand, it's a kind of, it's a streetwear brand, which at the same time produces in a collective way um, different forms of culture. And I think that's a quite strong new model um, of practice that we, that we, there are many examples. And you see it in the exhibition. At the entrance of the show, there is a sculpture by the uh, Austrian artist Heimut Sobernik. By, um, and you see this uh, mannequin, this kind of really classic normative show, um, shop mannequin with a sale t-shirt. And Heimut Sobernik's work is all about sculpture and about modernism. And of course, he shows how the, the ultimate kind of modernist sculpture derived into a show, uh, a, a, a show window mannequin, where you have this kind of commercialized normative body. And then if you enter the octagonal gallery, you see the uh, mannequin by Telfar, and you immediately see what kind of how he kind of challenged this normative modernist body that we see at the entrance of the show. Yeah, comparable to Telfar is the collective Anonymous Club that was uh, founded by Shane Oliver that did the um, famous street war label Hood by Air, ended it and then restarted it. And by restarting the label, kind of reconsidered what a fashion label could mean today and how one could create a new cycle of culture out of this. That if the label operates, today of course you need all this content, it's no more just of course the clothes that you look on in a show window, but it is these algorithms, all these images that bombard you. So anyways, brands create these concerts, um, uh, all these like, exhibitions around it, but he created within this logic its own capsule called Anonymous Club that feeds back to kind of club culture and music and to host other artists and residencies. And within this time when the exhibition uh, happened originally uh, at the ETH in Zurich, we worked together with Anonymous Club to build in these empty times where one could not see exhibitions, kind of our own warehouse within different stages. Artists would be guests and create um, music videos, one of them you see now in the exhibition, as these logistic centers that today house um, retail um, commerce. Yes, so today we went to see the uh, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, which was really great to see because it's, it was kind of almost part of this show that the museum is housed temporarily in the mall. And this project by Anonymous Club completely kind of deals with this premise. So in a time when the museum space often is kind of has to kind of um, 
more and more subsumed to deliver content for different commercial enterprises because there is this crave for narration content um, that then one could also just kind of take this as the starting point and this is what Shane Oliver tries to do in a really idealized form that he sees retail it's completely abstract it's um, basically it's kind of selling some kind of a kind of uh, simply a product of content so for uh, anonymous cop sells I don't know t-shirts or a hoodie which of course are only about what you don't get when you buy the product it's all about this immaterial content so he takes this as a premise and he creates in a really with integrity he creates records with young musicians he works with dance with artists with um, and with architecture here with the uh, Berlin-based architecture firm by Niklas Bildstein Saar, which is called SOP. And you will see the plans inside. And SOP also works with the German artist Anne Imhof. That is really also at this friction of retail and art. And, um, and yes, so that's, I think, this is, uh, I think these two Telfer and Anonymous Club, is, there are many more examples in this direction, but it's definitely kind of an interesting thread to follow. And this kind of reclaiming of this also generic world of content of like all over commercialization since the Harvard Guide to Shopping to now is, is something that we observe with many artists or also have more examples within the show. For example, the work of Gilly Tal and Richard Seitz in the exhibition you see these t-shirts that are kind of this super generic world of like tourist t-shirt that we live in, but they redo them and do them with a twist. Or the other clothes that you see in the show by Victoria Colmenia play with all these projections that one has to a young artist, all the references, the Foucault quotes, and this uh, kind of um, image that she herself then reappropriates on the clothes that she produces. So, yes, I think, so I hope we try to kind of explain this shift, but I think for us the crucial thing to learn was this shift from the idea that we look at ourselves, at um, other shoppers or at the goods, and that there is this kind of moment of the, this also this moment of a, a desire in this, in this kind of situation, that this more and more switches and that the kind of the goods on the other hand kind of scans us as data. So for us, the world becomes perhaps more and more opaque, but at the, at the same time, the products on the other end, they kind of observe us. And I think that's quite fascinating. And then of course, the question is there how to kind of subvert this um, Im uh, impossibility, so to say. And I think that's really a core in this show. And I think one work in this direction, also in the entrance to the octagonal room is by um, the fantastic New Jersey-based filmmaker and artist Alex Beck. And we are really proud that this work entered the CCA through all the different institutional gates. It's a, a museum storage display that contains shoplifted items by the artists. And they are presented like new archival materials that arrived in the museum. But then, of course, they kind of show this shift again from, from the kind of the really banal common good versus the valuable museum good and how this kind of threshold is really kind of a thin line. Thanks.